uh, and last presentation will be lecture by Professor Dr. Erwin Kalgua. Okay. Uh, he's from Republica de Guatemala, if I'm pronouncing it right. It is the land of returning spring. I'm really uh, happy to introduce Dr. Uh, Erwin. His lecture is covering a very, very hot topic. This topic is concerning not only the anesthesiologist, but also and almost all the specialities in medicine now. His lecture is titled COVID-19 Vaccine Induced Thrombotic Thrombocytopenic Purpura. Let me introduce to you Dr. Erwin. Dr. Erwin, he is a professor, research professor. He is the, the chairman of Biomedical Research Center at the National School of Medicine. He is a former director of research at the University of San Carlos. Uh, San Carlos is a school of medicine. He is a clinical epidemiologist at the Hospital General San Juan de Dios. He holds a research management position at San Tori El Bara, El Pilar, sorry, and uh, at the STEM care. Also, Dr. Erwin obtained his Master of Science in Clinical Epidemiology from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and he obtained his medical degree from, uh, from University de San Carlos de Guatemala. His concentration was in pharmacoepidemiology, mainly. Dr. Erwin's coll collaborative research efforts cover a wide range of topics, including COVID-19 and non-communicable disease, violence, malnutrition, adolescent health, stem cells, HIV, and many, many other more. Uh, please uh, go ahead. We are very much interested, uh, Dr. Erwin, to hear from you. Thank you very much, Heva, and thank you very much, Sahara, and these wonderful professors that are with us this morning and all of you who are taking the time for your continual medical education as well as being informed in new areas. And I feel thrilled about this invitation. So I, I'm going to be sharing my screen and COVID-19 vaccine induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia. That's going to be what I would like to make a quick overview based on the latest evidence. So I have no conflict of interest to declare. And the aims of this today is to be able to share with you the conceptualization of vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia, VIT, describe possible pathogenesis, describe most common clinical signs and symptoms, identify laboratory and imaging diagnosis, describe possible treatments, identify the medical multidisciplinary team and the preventive measures related to the second dose of COVID-19 vaccine under a circumstance of VIT. So let's begin about conceptualizing VIT. So globally, um, based on the data that is shared by the team of the Coronavirus Research Center at Johns Hopkins University. Of all the things that we find interesting to follow is the number of doses already. As you can see here, we're pretty much going to the 2 billion doses at this date. So it's interesting because um, by this time and this global effort to vaccinate all people that are more susceptible in the world, we must have we must see both efficacy and the safety of these vaccines. So we should have enough information based on what we're seeing in the populations that are receiving this vaccine. So we've seen that the efficacy of based on the threshold that the WHO established, which is 50% for uh, COVID-19 vaccines, most of them, and the platforms that we're going to see further, have uh, really surpassed the expectations we have, like pfizer Tech in this case, which is pretty close to 95, Moderna also close to 95, Sputnik V, which is pretty much to 92, Novavax, which is reaching in the rate and trial pretty much to the 80s, AstraZeneca, 
which it was uh, between 76 and now we're reaching the, the effectiveness there's not any more efficacy to, to the 90 percent which was last week's report and johnson and johnson which is close to 67 and sinovac which is close to 15. so these are probably the most known platforms for vaccines that we have on the efficacy results which is fantastic because most of these data come from um, randomized controlled trials, which have been done in tens of thousands of patients. But, but this is, it gives only one part of the picture because we know that randomized controlled trials do not give entirely, and especially in certain populations, the safety profile of a vaccine. So if you look at the different platforms we have currently, let's say we have five, two of them genetic, so we are basically looking at live attenuated vaccines, inactivated virus, protein subunits. We have viral vectors, the genetic vaccines, which is basically, basically on plasmid DNA and the genetic vaccines based on um, mRNA. And I could say is this ones here in this area, that we are basically looking at the safety profile and especially in these two, the viral vector and the messenger RNA, where we need to understand more about the safety profile. Again, it's important that we remember that vaccines are applied in healthy subjects. This is not applied to um, people with the diseases. So we want to stimulate in healthy subjects the production of antibodies to provide immunity against one or more diseases. And usually these vaccines are prepared from the causative agent of disease, its products or a synthetic substitute, which is treated to act as an antigen without inducing the disease. And that's basically the explanation in a very basic form of the different platforms. One important thing is the vaccine activates our immune system without getting sick. And this is part of also particular importance because a lot of people think that when they get a vaccine, they get sick. And many dangerous infection diseases can be prevented in this simple and effective way. And we know that since the last century. As a public health measure, actually the more successful and number one measure that has been uh, most important for humankind has been vaccinations. Another important concept is the innate immunity, which is the immunity with which an organism is born, and the adaptive immunity, which is the immunity that an organism develops during life. And is this one in here, what we are trying to um, understand better, that adaptive immunity, which we are acquiring, in this case, through vaccination, trying to prevent the disease. So once we understand this, let's talk about this bit. Is, so we also know it as vaccine-induced prothrombotic immune thrombocytopenia, by bit. It's also in another name is thrombotic thrombocytopenia syndrome. And most recently is vaccine-induced COVID-19 mimicry syndrome. So those are probably synonymous that you could look after in your search of literature. It's a rare adverse event that might be associated with SARS-CoV-2. And it has the following important features. So it can occur between day number one to 30 days after vaccination. And it is most frequently, but not exclusively, associated with low platelets, which is tiny blood cells that help form blood clots to stop bleeding. One important uh, aspect of this is these blood clots are usually more aggressive in the way it behaves. And most people believe that it's only linked to AstraZeneca, COVID Shield, and Janssen, Johnson and Johnson. However, let's go back in history. In on April 9, 2021, actually, there was a, an interesting uh, publication uh, in, in the American Journal of Hematology, which also called for the thrombocytopenia following Pfizer and Moderna SARS CoV 2 vaccination. In there, which was actually followed by some concerns reported in newspapers in the United States 
that basically identify the death of one person um, due to the vaccination. And therefore, that, that basically created a public alarm. And what they were able to follow is the, this, the development of this, what we call the immune thrombocytopenia, um, which is ITP related to the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine. And this immune thrombocytopenia, the incidence is unknown. And uh, it was well known that despite the fact that it was presenting to vaccination, it was below the risk of death and morbidity of SARS-CoV-2 infections. So that's the reason you didn't hear too much about it at the beginning. We only knew that Pfizer and Moderna was actually doing this and, and causing this post-vaccination, or at least associated, not causing, because causal, causality in epidemiology is another term, but it was suspected to be associated with immune thrombocytopenia. And by then, again, this is the role of uh, randomized controlled trials, which is RCTs, where Pfizer and Moderna had enrolled nearly 70,000 patients, and no one reported ITP. And, I, and that's important because I was looking today at the recent published uh, paper, also in New England Journal of Medicine, with uh, young people between 12 to 15. Uh, and they were enrolled in nearly 2,000 uh, patients. And uh, it's interesting The RCT also didn't mention anything about problems with safety. However, as some of you, and we'll see this uh, soon with the Pfizer BioNTech, there is already a cases reported in uh, children between 12 to 15 and 12 to seven, and 16 to 17 that are also presenting myocarditis. And in the, if you see the randomized control trials two days ago, that didn't say anything. So it's not, it's not rare that we do actually see our, our randomized control trials that do not show the safety profile. And that's uh, totally, especially with these new vaccines. We probably will be seeing this through the pharmacosurveillance that we need to do with these vaccinations. As of February 2021 in the US, there were approximately 20 million doses administered and 70 de novo cases of these ITP were um, presented. So again, people were not uh, and this shouldn't call, call to hesitancy by uh, the general public, because this didn't, this didn't exceed the estimation of ITP incidence in one year normally. And again, not only in this vaccine, this has been seen, it also had been seen in the measles, mumps, rubella vaccines, which is one in every 40,000 children, varicella vaccines, Suster vaccine, also other vaccinations have, pro have been linked to immune thrombocytopenia. And this is important because as we can see, this is not new and must be, by saying that it's not new, that means we must at least take a look to this and we shouldn't be surprised if uh, Pfizer or Moderna or even AstraZeneca and other have also some sort of immune um, action and call into thrombocytopenia uh, activity in, in a subject that has received those kind of vaccinations. So I, I mentioned about uh, ITP with uh, Pfizer and Moderna. We are now looking again to the BITT incidence. And this is between the range of one case per 26,000 to one case per 127,000 doses of AstraZeneca and Covishield. So it's just approximately one per 100,000 doses. Uh, as of now, we understand probably in Norway and Denmark are the ones that report the highest rates. And as of, as of April 28, 2021, the rate of bid in Canada was one per 100,000 doses. Now, interesting to note, despite these small numbers, it has a pretty considerable mortality rate between the 30 to 40%, mainly because of brain injury after quanticoagulation. And nearly all reported cases have occurred after the first dose. In regards to Jensen, Johnson and Johnson vaccine, it's one case per half a million vaccines doses administered so far. We, you have to remember always that all of this use adenovirus vector five as a platform as the vector viral. 
and we'll we'll talk about this more in the pathogenesis that's been uh, being hypothesized could be the cause of this. Now, in uh, April 16, 2021, the New England Journal of Medicine actually highlighted three independent descriptions of 39 persons with this newly described syndrome characterized by thrombosis and thrombocytopenia. thrombocytopenia. In here, and they state that it was between reported in of day five to 24. That's the reason we have a different range. I will suggest to you to always think about day number one to day number 30 so far when you are thinking about bed. And especially this is initial vaccinations and analysis with Chadox and COVID, which is the AstraZeneca, which is a recombinant chimpanzee adenovirus vector, as I mentioned before. And these are the three studies that were basically uh, published for those who would like to see it and read it, which I, I will invite you to do. It doesn't take too much time. And I think it's a wonderful reading and interesting reading if you want to be more learn about BIT. So I'm going to use again this, um, this uh, platform um, figure to show, to, to show here a point. So again, the live alternated vaccine, the inactivated virus and the protein subunit, that's so far we don't have data. We have data about the viral vector and we have about the genetic vaccine um, mRNA, not about the plasmid DNA so far. About the viral vector, if you wanna have some uh, magnitude of the problem, by the time there were 34 million doses, 169 cases of uh, cerebrovenous um, thrombosis, sinus thrombosis were uh, already suspected in patients having Chadox 1 and 53 with splachnic vein thrombosis. Please be aware that uh, this was not confirmed through the analysis, lab analysis that I'm gonna tell you, but these are reported as the numbers of people suspected with this time of thrombosis. The J&J &J had 7 million people, uh, 7 million doses given. Of this, six had cerebrovenous uh, sinus thrombosis with or without splachnic vein thrombosis. So be aware that it can not only be cerebral, but also be splachnic. And you'll see that when I explain to you more about the uh, clinical uh, aspect of VIT. The Fires BioNTech in, that has been, um, or was analysis 54 million, were 35 cases of central nervous thrombosis and Moderna in 4 million doses, five had cerebrovenous sinus thrombosis. So that gives you a general idea of what, how often this is. So it's relatively uh, rare, is rare, however, it's not zero. And that's an important issue in here. Now, a bit about pathogenesis. But pathogenesis at, up to this date is not clear. One other thing is it does not develop through the same process as more common types of bleeding or floating problems. And I quote here, one possible trigger of this PF4 reactive antibodies could be free DNA in the vaccine. We, uh, we have previously shown that DNA and RNA from multi-molecular complexes with PF4, which bind antibodies from patients with heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, and also induce antibodies against PF4 heparin in a murine model. And they have done this, this, this group is by Miriam E. Miriam, have done it in and published it in blood in 2003, and as you can see in here. So this is not new. We're actually, when you, uh, you can see in this figure, how basically the more RNA there is in the complex of the formation, there are more uh, specific bi uh, binding of the platelets. So uh, it is believed if you have more circulation of RNA in your system, you, are, you will have more binding of the, uh, based on this platelet factor activity. So there are other four probable explanations to what we are seeing with BID. Um, this is ITP, and you've heard about ITP with Pfizer and Moderna, has been reported after treatment with some antensense oligonucleotides, but this requires a high level of RNA to be able to reach the dendritic cells and the lead nodes to cause what we are seeing. The other is the perform antibodies against polyethylene glycol or other components. 
So it's believed that could be antibodies directed against novel antigen formed by attachment of vaccine particles on a small number. So platelets trigger a reaction involving all platelets. And three, some patients ha have had mild compensated thrombocytopenia of the various causes, like pre-existing ITP or hereditary thrombocytopenia that for some reason activate once they receive the vaccination or the post-vaccination ITP. I was looking at the most recent uh, paper published in this, and it was actually in the news, May 26. And this is a group that termed this bit as the vaccine-induced COVID-19 mimicry syndrome. And this hypothesis is interesting. What they say is, I quote, here we present data that may explain the severe side effects, which have been attributed to adenoviral vaccines. So according to our results, transcription of wild type and codon optimizes spike open reading frames, enables alternative splice events that lead to the seed terminal truncated, soluble spike proteins variants. These soluble spike variants may initiate severe side effects when binding to AC2 expressing endothelial cells in blood vessels. In the analogy to the thromboembolic events caused by SPAC protein encoded by the SARS-CoV-2 virus, we term the underlying disease mechanism, the vaccine-induced COVID-19 mimicry syndrome. In other words, or more simple words, what they're saying is the adenovirus life cycle includes the infection of cells. Entry of the adenoviral DNA into the nucleus and subsequently gene transcription by the host transcription machinery. And exactly here lies the problem. They say the viral piece of DNA is not optimized to be transcribed inside the nucleus. Therefore, inside the nucleus, part of the spike protein splice, that's, this is the key part, so the spike protein splice or split apart. And this become mutant protein pieces which float off into the body that can very rarely trigger blood clots. And so that's what this group already uh, is I proposing an hypothesis. And I, and I believe and understand that they have been talking with J&J, &J, uh, no communication with AstraZeneca with these groups so they can tell them about this hypothesis. So what kind of signs and symptoms we could uh, expect with VIT? So, um, if you want to do your own search terms, I will suggest that you can begin with something like this, which is in this, uh, which is basically um, there's the databases with the vaccine adverse re events reporting systems, or you can do it in PubMed or any other platform you want to use as the Chris plat platelet count, immune thrombocytopenia, MRH, PTK, contusion. So based on these search terms, it's, it's been found that the median age of people that present is 41 years old and the predominant sex is female. And I, and I think this probably could be the most of the two most prognostic factors that, that we can find so far. Being around that age, I will say, and I will suggest usually to think about bit, especially in women under age 40. The onset is between a range of days of one to 30 days. Key is usually these patients don't have a pre-existing use of heparin or they don't have a history of thrombocytopenia. 10% have had autoimmune conditions. They have bleeding symptoms prior to hospitalization, petechia. And I, interestingly, I have found that some people, we in Guatemala are receiving AstraZeneca, and we have both the COVAX, through the COVAX system, receiving the one that is coming to Guatemala, and the other one that was licensed by India, COVID shield. And interestingly, br uh, bruising. Bruising is something that is uh, key in these cases. And another thing, most of these are being observed in ambulatory settings. So we have to be very careful as general physicians, I would say, uh, to alert general physicians about uh, this, this aspect, because they might not be thinking about this possible uh, diagnosis when the, when the patients are um, basically going to their offices when they go, because most of the 
time, the people just think that is a normal bruise and they just say, well, it's a bruise. I don't know why, but it's, it's like, I will not, they don't even go or consult for this reason. But bruising is a very common uh, thing that we can see after uh, the vaccination with AstraZeneca in the people that we suspect. Other things is this three specifically are related to the reactogenicity of the, um, of the uh, vaccine. And so fever, chills, and myalgia are also um, related to VIT, but it tends to be confused with the normal reactogenicity, but you will not expect fever, chills after uh, week one, just to say. Uh, even after 48 to 72 hours. So if someone represents with that, that's important to think about. Severe headache also is another issue. Uh, I think it's very common, severe headache based on the patients I have seen. Seizure, uh, difficulty in voluntary moves, blurry vision or double vision, difficulty speaking, shortness of breath, and pain in the chest, back, or abdomen. This is a key issue in here that we have to be very careful with because there are people that actually complain of this kind of problem. Severe swelling, redness, pallor, coldness, or pain of arm and leg are also are important issues in these areas. Then uh, there are protocols that this one published by uh, the uh, pay in uh, in. And in Canada, which I think is important, they give you a hint about which are the basic uh, symptoms, and they give you an idea of what you do and what kind of studies you can run and how you can interpret data studies to uh, to the point of a make a presumptive diagnosis of, of BID. About the laboratory and imaging with BID, I will say that um, Remember always to perform SARS-CoV-2, RT-PCR, and antibodies for a nucleocapsid protein. It's important to rule out the possibility of having that patient positive to SARS-CoV-2, and that's the reason probably, which is 16% of the possibility of having uh, thrombos, uh, uh, thromb thrombosis in patients with them. That's the reason we actually anticoagulate them. Run, it, it's simple. The simple thing that can help and save a life with it is just perform a complete blood count because you're expecting to have low platelets. And so if you're having a low platelet, you can read that easily. You don't have to have a sophisticated system or laboratory to do that. If you have a platelet count that uh, is between, and it's been found a median of two to the 10,000, elevated to the nine uh, liters, uh, you can begin to think and suspect of bid. Um, it's very unusual to have a patient that have a platelet count before, uh, before the vaccination. Uh, so that's, that's always a bummer. And I don't, I don't usually say people to go and have a CBC before you are having a vaccination. I not even do that. Um, uh, but bit is more likely symptoms uh, is if between the day four to the 20, 28, you will find a platinum count less than 150, to 10 to the nine light liters. But this is not an absolute rule because as I've told you, and some studies have been found did in people that doesn't really uh, have thrombocytopenia. And B, testing involves two steps, identification antibodies against complex platelet factor four and heparin. I'm gonna come back with this later on. And a confirmatory functional testing of the antibodies to activate platelets. This is gonna be important, especially this is following what is called uh, the protocol with HIT ELISA. And uh, confirming always is key in, in this kind of patients. And so, um, I will add, I, I, I showed to you that this was uh, something that pay, uh, basically that in, in Canada, I will add in here that of key importance are fibrinogen and anti-PA4 antibodies to what they have published. Uh, you also would like to run a thrombophilia profile, which includes fibrinogen, which we expect to be lower normal, the D-dimer, which will be elevated. And other studies as prothrombin time, activated partial thromboplastin time, dilute Roswell viperbenum time, thrombin time, antithrombin activity, protein C activity, protein C antigen free, prothrombin G220210 A mutation, and activated protein resistance as C reactive protein and international norm normalized ratio. I've said to you that. Uh, 
to confirm the diagnosis, you always try to get a laboratory one that has been like um, so far thought based on the uh, similarity of heat with beat uh, is the a platelet factor four. So be aware that you can even have a qualitative and quantitative uh, re result. In any case, you want to have a positive or high levels of um, uh, factor four. Uh, there was a beautiful paper uh, published by Prof. Guell at New England Journal of Medicine. I was fortunate to ask him about this. And it's better if you conduct this in the acute phase, which is pretty much in, week, in, in the first uh, days or you know, immediately and up to the week four. Uh, remember that chemiluminescence as a technique could be negative, but the LISA test should be positive. So that's the reason you always have to confirm. The LISA tests that have been published is the Life Codes PF4 IgG assay, which is Immunicore. You will find a normal range of um, optic density less than 0.238 units. The, the other one is Acerchrom HPIA with IgG assay from Stago, a normal range of less than 0.40 uh, ODs. You always have to confirm with a HIT assay, which is called HIT Alert Diapharma. You can find other ones. You expect more than 8% platelet activation, which has a 78% sensitivity and 98 specificity. And their reference laboratories is not any laboratory that usually run, run this test. And be aware, there again, there are tests that are usually uh, fast. Uh, you should be careful with those. Uh, you should always have like in a reference laboratory analyze a test that can uh, confirm this uh, platelet factor four. You also should run anti-nuclear antibodies, antiphospholipid antibodies. And don't forget, because we've seen this myocarditis troponin levels in patients. Uh, this was published in New England, uh, New England Journal of Medicine. And I'm sorry, it's not well, like, it's, it's small, but it's just to give you a hint of there are other protocols of how you should manage uh, the, this bit. Um, about imaging, I will tell you that I think it's very useful to have a Doppler ultrasound of the limbs. And always remember, look not only for venous, because most people believe that this thrombus of the venous venous, but also for arterial, please. Because, uh, and you will... Uh, be amazed. Some of them begin as venous and then they develop the arterial throm thrombus. So don't think only that you will find venous thrombus in, uh, in, in, in Doppler ultrasound. You should run a brain CT MRI scan or venogram looking for cerebral hemorrhage or cerebral sinus vein thrombosis when suspected. I told you people have abdominal pain don't hesitate to run an abdominal CT MRI scan, looking for splenic vein thrombosis. As also, uh, uh, basically a CTA contrast enhanced computed tomography and geography, uh, or a magnetic resonance angiography, looking at vessels. These are key imaging features that are uh, in the literature I've been able to find that are very useful. And through our patients here, uh, that we're suspecting, we're studying still, this is something important that we are thinking, we're looking after BIT. Now going to treatments. I will say that uh, the corticosteroids and IVGs are probably the key issues in here because the two should be, should be administered before anticoagulation therapy. Somehow, people that receive anticoagulation without doing the IVG and corticosteroids tends to have a worse um, outcome. The intravenous immune globulin impedes antibody-mediated platelet turians and may downregulate platelet activation by immune complexes by blocking platelet um, FC air gamma 2A receptors. You also have the possibility to have platelet transfusions, but be aware you have to be very careful on this and don't do anything without consulting an hematologist. I think one of the most, um, I, I'm telling you, I will share this about the multidisciplinary team, but uh, be careful about this platelet transfusions. There are other uh, medications like erythuximab, Romy plus two, vancristine, amino caproic acid, amicard have been used. Combination therapies probably are the most uh, successful, especially corticosteroids, IVG, and when, when possible, platelet transfusion. But 
the combination is a key so far with the with what I've seen is successful with some of the patients that have survived to the bit. Um, the favorable response to ITP directed therapies most treated patients are corticosteroids and IVGs, and this should suggest you an antibody mediated platelet clearance mechanism that is operative in ITP. How long this could take to respond uh, for treatment? Probably eight weeks, a little bit more. That depends a lot of the patient and how fast they consult. Some have used non-heparin anticoagulant agents like fondaparinux, which is an indirect inhibitor of factor uh, 10A, but it does not inhibit thrombin at all. Argatruban, danaparoid, and direct oral anticoagulants. Plasma exchange with plasma rather than albumin to reduce pathologic antibodies and correct coagulopathy like hypofibrinogenemia could be used. And there is some uh, suggestion about using amylifidase, which is a cysteine protease and eliminates AFC dependent effector functions. Again, this is all hypothetic and is being used. It's not in randomized clinical trials, but it's what is in the so far uh, in the literature review of uh, what we, uh, what's been published on this area. And this is again from the group uh, of uh, Dr. Pai in, in Canada. Uh, which is treating patients six basic um, uh, keys for this uh, no aparin, avoid platelet transfusions, first line anticoagulants, direct oral factor X inhibitors, consult hematology in person virtually by phone and discuss treatment like hit ELISA testing and functional testing, send hit ELISA testing before given any IVGs, that's key, uh, rapid hit essays are not sensitive and may yield false negative results. And if you want to use IBG, so far the dose everywhere is one gram per kilogram actual body weight daily for at least two days. Then again, this is uh, in the New England, the same protocol for treatment. The multidisciplinary team management, which should include at least a hematologist, emergency medicine doctor, surgeon, radiologist, laboratory specialist, intensive care specialist, anesthesiologist, cardiologist, pneumologist, neurologist, immunologist, physiotherapist, nursing specialist, and nutritionist. And finally, prevention about should I take a second dose of COVID-19 vaccine? Well, I, I go straight this. If you have is this is related to AstraZeneca? What's the, the Canadian uh, the, in Canada? They've said that it's better to withhold the second dose and then uh, uh, wait or usually use um, mRNA based COVID 19 vaccine that could be safe. But remember, you also, it also can produce IDP. So you have to bear that in mind. So um, Basically, this is uh, it. I do appreciate the time and I hope this has been of help and of interest to you. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm really, I'm overwhelmed by this amount of knowledge I learned this uh, session and all the day. Uh, actually, thank you, uh, Dr. Erwin, for this very updated and very informative, elegant and highly attractive lecture. Um, uh, thank you. I cannot thank you enough, actually. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, there's uh, no question till now, but I have a question myself, if you allow me. Um, you, you told us about the predominant sex and age predisposition for this uh, uh, this complication of the vaccine, vaccine induced thrombocytopenia. So, do do you suggest any age is um, considered safe or minimal regarding this complication specifically? So we can, uh, you know, recommend a specific type of vaccine uh, for to avoid this complication. Well, Hiba, that's. The, uh... That's a wonderful question. I think it's a key question. What I say to the patients in here and what I say in Guatemala is, if you were under 40 years of age and you're a woman, I will suggest probably looking after another platform of, uh, of a vaccination. So you have, if, if there is that possibility. And here in Guatemala, we have AstraZeneca so far and Sputnik. Uh, we don't have any of the mRNA vaccine, vaccines. A Sputnik so far hasn't been linked to this um, uh, the safety outcomes that you're seeing. And I think uh, it's something that is worth to share with the patients. In certain countries, it's been said 
that a woman under age 40s is better if they don't receive uh, AstraZeneca. And that's the reason you will see that in, 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 in some areas, they are not, they're even preferring other, um, other platforms, in this case, for women under 40. Uh, I think it's worth to, to, to mention and to bear it in mind, specifically for young women. We have a lot of healthcare workers that are in that age, and some of them will not even uh, go to bid, but I, I even develop bid, but they will develop bruising or they will be developing some mild clothing disorder should be taken care of before this can be more sensitive because we know this only from the first dose, not the second dose. But I will emphasize, if possible, women under age 40 uh, should be thinking about other platforms at some point um, in, in, in this global uh, vaccination strategy and the local vaccination strategy in countries. Okay, that's very informative. Thank you very much.